Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Pastor Steve. I'm the pastor here at the church. I've been Dave's pastor for four years now, and I got to say it was a wonder to just know the man. Um, he was very, very kind and gentle to our family. And so I just want to say thank you very much for being here in honor of, of him and Marilyn and the family. I will put this on just for you, Marilyn. You know, Delbert told me to put this on. I should have listened to him. Delbert, publicly, I say I'm sorry. <laughs> and, all right, is that better for you, Marilyn? No? How's that? Okay. We'll do our best to speak loud, um, but not blow everybody out, so... But I do want to welcome all of you, and thank you all very much for being here. Thank you for your love and support to Dave and Marilyn over the years. And uh, at this time, we're going to just read the obituary, and then we'll pray. Uh, so let's, let's, let me read this for you so that we're kind of all on the same page. Uh, it's a wonderful obituary, very memorable for all that Dave has been involved in. David Badger, born in Lodi, Ohio, on March 14, 1940. David was the eldest son of Clifford and Helen Fair Badger. He graduated from Northwestern High School in 1958. He then attended Manchester College in Indiana. That summer, he joined a, combi a combine gang out west, traveling from Texas to Canada. A cornerstone of David's faith was his belief in pacifism. In lieu of military service in 1960, David entered Brethren Voluntary Services, BVS, and was sent to British Honduras, Belize, to serve on an early disaster response team after a hurricane. He went on to Nigeria, West Africa, and served uh, until December 1963. Then for nine months, he traveled eastward, stopping in Egypt, Lebanon, India, Thailand, Iraq, Iran, Australia, Fiji, Hawaii, and Canada before returning home to West Salem, Ohio. David graduated from Ohio State University in June 1966. He married Marilyn Carol Kettering on July 9th, 1966, and they had two daughters, Bethany, oh, I got a, <laughs> I read from the wrong one. Hang on one second. I did write these down. Freudenreich, did I get it right, Bethany? There we go. All right. Bethany Freudenreich uh, and Carl, and also Andrea Sue uh, Badger Yo. Dave worked for John Deere for over 33 years, and he started out in the service department. He moved on to a position as the Ohio Service Territory Manager, and later moved to Columbus to work as a service training instructor at the branch headquarters. He retired in December of 1998, though he continued to teach classes as a consultant for the training center. In his free time, he enjoyed restoring antique tractors and equipment. He later served as president of the Ohio Two Cycle Club, which is John Deere, and Massey Harris Ferguson Club of Ohio. He also published machinery articles in magazines and newsletters. He taught workshops about implements at tractor shows, and he researched uh, to author an unwritten book about combines. David had an, un, uh, an enduring curiosity and enjoyed reading across a wide range of topics. His interests included studying birds and nature. He was a member of societies that promoted the preservation of historical barns, canals, mills, and covered bridges. Throughout his life, he maintained a strong interest in other cultures and a sense of adventure, which he passed on to his daughters. Above all, David's faith was at the core of his life. He served at, here at Maple Grove as a deacon a trustee, Sunday school teacher, and Agape Acre representative, and helped with the new church building. He was a loving and faithful example to his family. 
in such daily ways as kneeling by his bed to pray each night and faithfully loving his wife and entrusting God despite all of his challenges and illnesses. David was preceded in death by his brother, James. He is survived by his brothers, Philip, Carl, and John. He enjoyed the love of a large extended family of nieces, nephews, and in-laws, and his beloved Australian shepherd, Lexi. Shall we pray? Lord, today we, we mourn the loss of a friend, of a dad, of a husband, of a brother. Lord, we will miss David dearly. And we thank you for the life that he had. We thank you for the amazing grace that he showed all through his life. Today, Lord, as we mourn, we also celebrate because we know his home is heaven. And so, God, we are full of mixed emotions. But today, Lord, we know that you comfort us and you care about us. And Lord, we know that David would want us to know that it is well with him right now. So Lord, we honor you and we glorify you and we thank you for the life that we were able to share with Dave. And we pray for this service in your blessed name. Amen. Why don't we all stand and we'll sing our first song. It is well with my soul. All of these songs our very, very favorite songs of Dave. So sing these out if you would. We'll sing the first verse and the fourth verse. and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. It's amazing to me that Dave right now is in the presence of God Almighty. Let's sing this together, How Great Thou Art.
Thank you so much. You may be seated. Uh, at this time, Delbert is going to come and share, and he's also going to lead us in a time where uh, we're going to have an opportunity to share some of our memories and uh, fond uh, thoughts towards Dave. Delbert, come on forward. If some of you don't know, I'm the elder brother of Marilyn and uh, supposedly the example of what she should be. <laughs> she asked me to say a few words about David and she doesn't know what she's asking for a guy who's had 58 years of pastoral to say a few words about David. I asked the Lord, what should I say? Number one, can you hear me? Okay. I asked the Lord and he said, talk about how blessed David was. And when I got to thinking about blessed and blessed, he led me to the Beatitudes. And I want to share this in my thinking about David and how blessed he is. I won't be talking about his tremendous mechanical ability. I won't be talking about his adventures. I will be talking about his spirit. Jesus gathered his disciples about him and he taught them. And he said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That sure sounds funny to me, to be poor in spirit. And then I get to thinking about what Jesus really meant here. The opposite of poor in spirit is those who are proud of themselves and think they have already got it made and they have an angle and a, and a knowledge of God that nobody else has, and they are superior spiritually. Those kinds of people never grow because they think they're already grown. But to be poor in spirit means that I still have growth to take place in my spiritual life. That was David. He was blessed because all of his life was spent in growing mentally, spiritually, probably not physically, but socially. He always was learning. A house full of books and magazines, even on his bed at the end, he was reading tractor magazines. He was still growing. And he was growing in spirit and understanding of God. He was blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. To understand Jesus' saying here, we have to understand what it means to mourn. To mourn is to feel with other people, to have a sense of empathy. Those who do not mourn are the people who are so self-centered that they have all the answers and they don't have any growth to do. They don't feel what others feel. They are arrogant and proud. That was not David. David knew how to mourn, to feel with other people, to understand their hurts and to understand their joys. That's what it means to be a deacon, and that's what he was. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The opposite of meek is to be proud and arrogant and self-sufficient and self-centered. He had a lot of reason to be proud, I suppose. He was so gifted in so many ways, and yet 
everybody was an equal to him and a friend. And he loved people, all kinds of people. It didn't matter what their color was, their background, or who they were. He loved people. And it showed so much when he was, especially in Africa. <clears throat> he watched them taking the wheat and taking the old stone, uh, sticks and beating out the wheat on the ground. And so he asked the men from Pennsylvania to send him a thrashing machine. And they sent him a thrashing machine. He had to learn how to, how to make babbits to correct all, all the bearings and everything. But he never forgot the look on the faces of the men when he started that machine and put the sheaves of wheat in it and it blew straw out of that blower and the grain came down the greenery. He was meek, humble. And humble people learn, learn and are willing to grow and are willing to learn. Blessed are the humble, the meek, for they learn all their lives, they learn. But if you already know it all, you don't learn everything. So the meek you know, are the blessed people. He was blessed. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He hungered and thirsted not only for knowledge, but to do what was right always. He never treated a person in his life. He always was aware of their presence and their love. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The unmerciful don't feel for others. The unmerciful think only of themselves and what they're getting out of it. But those who are merciful to others will receive mercy to themselves. He was blessed because he was merciful. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart here has nothing to do with sex. The pure in heart here means to have one aim in life. His aim in life was people. His aim in life was to share God's love with people. That was his aim in life. And he didn't vacillate from that. In all of his life, he lived a pure life. And then, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. For children are like their parents, you know, and we are like the Christ who came to show what the Father is like, what he wants us to be, a people of peace and all humility who reverence life and all humanity, both in this world and to eternity, he was a peacemaker. He was blessed. But it's no good to be a blessed if you're not a blessing to others. And he was a blessing to others as well. This was David. As he exemplified the love of God for his fellow men. And that's what we are called to do, to exemplify the love of God to our fellow people that we love. Blessed is a life we are to live to be a blessing to others as well. This is my view of David as my brother-in-law, whom I admired and who taught me a lot, and I hope I taught him as well. He was blessed. He was a blessing. And we would like you to share what your experiences and what your feelings are about David as well. And we have a microphone, it's a time for an open mic. And 
Who would like to be the first one to share? Please raise your hand because somebody's got to start. We're bringing you a mic. And please kiss the mic. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm not very good at this, so I'm Carol Buell. My husband, Doug, and I got to know Doug, David through John Deere Company. Doug worked with David, and we were in East Moline, and he was in Columbus, Ohio. So we didn't get to see each other very often. But they would uh, see each other at meetings. And after both of them had retired, Doug was reading the Massey magazine. And he had seen a, an article that David had written. And he said, Carol, I know David. I'm going to get in touch with him. So he got the telephone number, and he called David. And from that time on, these two had the most blessed, greatest relationship that you could possibly have. We didn't get to see Dave and Marilyn very often, but we would meet them at different tractor shows and spend a few days with them at the tractor shows. One that I remember specifically is when John Deere celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Lawn and Garden Tractors. And we went to Horicon, Wisconsin, and spent the weekend with David Marilyn up there. And it's some of the greatest memories that we have of them. But Doug and David would get on the phone and sometimes they would talk for two hours. And it would be everything you could possibly imagine from tractors to combines to John Deere to Massey to their time with John Deere and their faith. They shared their faith together. Doug has such special, special memories of David, but it's hard for him to be able to stand up and talk about this. So on behalf of Doug and myself, we just want to tell the family how much we loved all of you and how much we loved David. And Marilyn, you have been as much of a blessing in our life as what David was. And we will continue that with you and your family. So please accept our condolences for you and for what you're going through at this time. And please know, no matter what, we're always here for all of you. I don't think anybody kept track of all the hours that David spent on both the computer and the telephone helping people with their tractors and things. Anybody else? I'm Karen and Marilyn is my aunt, and Bethany and Andrea are my cousins. I want to tell Marilyn how much you and Dave have meant to us, especially when we found out my husband also had prostate cancer, and you and Dave reached out with compassion and love and spoke to both of us individually. We have always looked forward to family get-togethers because we like to get to visit with each other, but Marilyn, I just want to tell you that was so impactful for both of us. Thank you so much. Anyone else over in the corner, Aaron? Uh, I'm Aaron Beebe, and I am uh, part of Dave and Marilyn's church family. 
And um, I just wanted to say when um, I became a deacon here at Maple Grove, um, Dave and Marilyn were both very um, encouraging and not just when we became deacons, but through our time as deacons. And they are both have just been such um, wonderful and caring and supportive people. And I'm very grateful to them for that. Okay, anyone else? Hi, I'm Joe Slater. <clears throat> and I knew Dave through the High Two Cylinder Club. And uh, actually, when I first got my first tractor, he was one of the first person I happened, had the luck of stumbling across and asking questions, and he was very helpful to me. And uh, then we got to know him through the club. Uh, he helped with the newsletter a lot. He had a lot of information he shared in, in our expos. Uh, even though he was struggling with uh, his health, he was always uh, excited to come, had good displays. And it just uh, was uh, always helpful to the club, and we really appreciate all the years that he's contributed to and all the people he's uh, touched with that and friendships he's made. So thanks. Anyone else? Thank you. I'm Ben Freudenreich, Carl's dad, and uh, Karen and I are only children. And so we, when Carl was busy on the road or Kristen was out somewhere, we had a very small Thanksgiving get together. Uh, then Carl met Bethany, and they invited us to their Thanksgiving celebration here in Ashland. And so we came up and there were 35 people and we, we had name tags we put on everybody. Uh, we, we try to remember everybody, but you know, we're getting older too. Anyway, we enjoyed the meal, and after the meal, I'm a city boy, see? After the meal, the guys, guys got together and they started talking about tractors. <laughs> and they got out books about tractors. And I thought, what is there about a tractor that's so interesting? <laughs> well, David and I got to know each other, and I, I'm an aficionado of old steam engines. And it turns out that fits right in with Dave. So we exchanged over the years information about steam engines in different countries. And at one point, he called me and said there was a meeting in Mount Vernon. And he expected maybe if I would like to go to that. So I did, and I went, and that was where I first met Mike's dad. Uh, so they had this one meeting about the steam, in, steam tractors and steam machinery. So uh, I wish Dave and I had lived closer together. We could have had a lot of fun together. But uh, then Carl got us a special Father's Day gift. And that was a ride on the steam train on Cuyahoga Valley. Uh, that was a fantastic experience. And it's a beautiful reconditioned steam engine that they bring in from Fort Wayne, Indiana. And as we're standing there looking at it, Dave says, they have that Baker valve on there. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm the aficionado on the steam engines. I don't know what a Baker valve is. <laughs> so anyway. I learned a lot of things from Dave, and I, I sure do miss him. So I just wanted to thank you and Marilyn for bringing us into the family. So. OK, anyone else? Anyone else? I want to give all the opportunity. Uh, while you're kind of thinking about things, as a pastor, um, many pastors kind of pride themselves on jokes. And I could always count on David to be that one person that's going to laugh. My joke could bomb and no one laughs, but I could always count on Dave to laugh. And it would be that, ah! 
<laughs> so it almost brought more people to laugh. Maybe they were laughing at Dave and not my joke, but it was always nice to know if Dave was in the audience that uh, he would laugh at my jokes. So anyone else? Going once? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, actually, David's laugh kind of reminded me of something I wanted yeah. to share, too. But um, so I'm uh, his son-in-law, and, uh, you know, when you're first meeting, you know, the in-laws, I think one of the first things I learned about David is the man is comfortable with silence. <laughs> and so what am I going to, you know, uh, share or, you know, how am I going to talk to, you know, this uh, man of the, you know, the father of the woman I love? And so I paid attention, and I was like, oh, wow, he talks about tractors. And I thought, that is not helping me at all. <laughs> and then I paid a little bit more attention. I was like, okay, he talks about the weather. Again, doesn't help me at all. Um, but I think it was mentioned, you know, uh, Delbert had mentioned about uh, the blessings that David had passed and his love of various things. And I think... One of the things he passed to his daughter was a uh, love of nature and birds and travel. Mm -hmm. And I, again, didn't help me a whole lot at the time, but, you know, I think through the influence of his daughter, I also uh, began to love birds. And then, boom, I can actually talk to David about birds. And I, you know, which was great. And we did a lot. Um, and I recently, I went birding and I was just kind of, picturing David being there with me. And I think one of the things I really appreciated and loved about uh, David was just, you know, I, was, I saw an, an olive-sided flycatcher, and I was thinking, you know, David would be really, really uh, thrilled about that. You know, he, I mean, just the sense of wonder at that, and you could almost say, oh, wow, you know, like, and, you know, that transferred to other things, too. And, you know, actually in terms of trying different foods, and this is a phrase I have heard from nobody else but if you did not like something, he would tell you your tongue needed to be scraped. I, 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 I'm not sure I actually understand what that means, but I think for David that meant that, you know, you needed to be open-minded. You know, if you would just be open-minded, if you would scrape your, these attitudes you have in your tongue, I think that's maybe what it means. I honestly don't know. Um, you know, you know, he, you know, you would actually maybe enjoy the food. And there's lots of foods that I've gotten to enjoy because I think, yeah, I, my tongue needs scraped. If I can just scrape my tongue, I can probably enjoy this. Um, and occasionally, of course, David's human too, so he doesn't like everything either. And if you would point that out to him, like, you know, David, you need your tongue scraped, and you know, that that that's when you really saw him. Heard he him would, laugh. he was not afraid to laugh at himself either. Yeah. And he would just laugh and laugh and laugh. So I really thank, I'm really thankful that, uh, you know, those are just many of the many blessings that David have get, has given us. And I really appreciate that. So. Yeah, thank you so much. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. I'm Carl Freudenreich. My dad already spoke, and I feel like I probably should add a little bit to that. Uh, when I started dating Bethany, um, I thought I was uh, starting a relationship with somebody who was a theater kid, uh, and we would be in uh, productions and, and doing things with entertainment. Um, I did not understand at that time how much of a John Deere person her father was. Um, and uh, just a, a short story, uh, the first time that Bethany brought me up to the family for one of those Thanksgiving dinners, um, the, uh, the Friday after that, I was not prepared for the events that David had planned for me. Um, <laughs> the, uh, early in the morning after breakfast, he said to me, um, I have a need to take an engine out of a garden tractor. Can you help me with that? And I believe uh, that was probably the first test he put me through to see if I was worthy of marrying his daughter. Um, I th the engine came out. Um, I don't know where or what happened with that engine, but I think I may have tripped over it a couple of times in the shed. Uh, but uh, I, I guess I, I may have passed the test. Um, I've been, it's been an honor to get to know him. Uh, everybody has said many other things that are, uh, I can't say, I can't, I can't say it any better than other people have said. So 
um, it's been an honor to, to know him uh, up until this point. So thank you. Uh, I'm not usually a person of few words when I get going. Um, but I wrote something. Um, I wrote something, and of course, I'm not at a. Uh, <laughs> yes, honey, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm in the way. Thank you. Okay. Um, and we'll see if I can make it through it. <laughs> it is said that our fathers shape our view and understanding of our Heavenly Father. Many people do not understand this, but I do. I had such a good example of a loving father. But I get ahead of myself. <laughs> Let's start at the very beginning. Well, my sister believes that our father was her daddy. But the truth of the matter is that I had the honor of making him a parent, a dad. I have been told that when I was a baby, he would nap with me on his chest. An avid photographer, he took lots of pictures of me, his new little model. In bed, laying among a bed of fresh spring daffodils in the garden, and later yanking on the freshly washed blanket on the clothesline. When dad and mom brought my sister home, supposedly I wanted them to bring another. <laughs> I think that meant in addition to her rather than instead of her, but I digress. As children of a guy who enjoyed taking pictures, had a passion for machinery and old structures, and loved his family, there were many, many pictures of my sister and I standing beside the wheels of steam engines, tractors, to show how big the machine was. Posing in front of trains and planes, hanging out beside covered bridges and mills. The yearly pictures of the Thanksgiving tables all of the family knows about, loaded with food made by grandmothers and carried in by various relatives. The other day, my husband Carl noted that dad is rarely in any of these pictures, unless his pant leg happened to get caught in the corner of a frame, as he usually was the one behind the camera. Similarly, we see the handiwork of our Heavenly Father, though we do not often catch or see his face. Every now and then, we might catch a glimpse of him. But that was dad, not seeking the spotlight, but rather behind the scenes, helping and making things work. He served on the mission field, on the farm in Nigeria, helping get the thrashing machine working and agriculturally supporting the hospital so families could stay together while their loved ones were ill and recovering. He rode the range and worked on a sheep farm in Australia so that the ranch family could get away and take a vacation a rare thing for a fam farm family. Similarly, we see our Abba Father's support often not in the spotlight, but rather in the support he provides each and every one of us. When it came time for me to learn to drive, it was a fairly big deal. I had been driving the <clears throat> bigger tractors, two cylinders, on the farm since I was 12 and mowing a little earlier than that. But we moved to the big city when I was 14, and driving stopped. At 16, no one was ready for me to drive a car. I got my permit late. It expired once, and it had to be renewed before my driving classes and getting my license. When up here in rural Ashland County with less traffic, mom decided to try and practice with me on the stick shift car. I remember we had come up to the farm and she took me on the very unbusy divided four lane highway section of 42. I stalled the car at the intersection, intersection of 604 and 42. Mom and I were disintegrating and Andrea was lying down in the back seat not wanting to be seen by anyone we knew. <laughs> 
From then on, Dad took over my field experience in driving. We would drive on the semi-country roads near our city home. He sat beside me, calmly riding and sometimes quietly making suggestions. When I got too close to a mailbox, his hand would reach out, grasp the wheel, and just slightly correct the course of the car. Isn't that like our, what our Father God does? Sometimes a gentle correction puts us back onto the main road. When I moved into college, Dad took, towed a snowmobile trailer full of my things to the dorm. His words upon leaving were something like, don't expect to come home every weekend. That time is as much college as your classes. Take advantage of the opportunity to make new friends, try other churches, and explore new activities. We tried to teach you well. Now it's your turn to make your own decisions. It was those words that led me to hang out with a group of girls who would try a different church every Sunday. Pentecostal, gospel, conservative, evangelical. But this did not last long as each of us found a church home away from home within a month or so. But I do not think I would have tried it had it not been for dad's guidance like a life coach. After basically serving as an older sister nanny for my young cousins as they moved from the States to another country, my dad came overseas to accompany me home. Before leaving, we spent three weeks on safaris, which, by the way, is just the Swahili word for taking a trip. You can take a safari to the grocery store. Seeing parts of the word world neither of us had ever seen and probably would not get a chance to see again. We got up before dawn to watch elephants in a water hole, stayed near lakes where flamingos get their pink color, drove on the <clears throat> wrong side of the road, which Dad couldn't keep track of, which was funny, in my uncle's car, slept in mosquito-netted beds, took pictures with neither of us in them, and rode overnight on a train from the capital Nairobi to the coast. On the way home, he insisted on our flight that I dress up because people who are dressed nicely get treated nicely. When I worked as a drama teacher, dad would help with a prop for almost every show. One time he and mom brought the old metal bed frame and mattress from the apartment, from, for the apartment to, for the diary of Anne Frank. He created a rolling ivy pole for another play and he dug up an antique pump and made water gush out of it for the miracle worker, a significant pro prop for the play about Helen Keller's life. He was an inventor, a maker, a designer, and a creator of things. In this too, he emulated his father in heaven. A glimpse in his heavily hand-noted Bibles the old black and red revised standard one and the newer one in a zipper cover has notations back to when I was in high school, and that's the newer one. And the large library that he amassed of a wide range of topics is a testament to his curiosity and desire to study. The Bible tells us to study and show ourselves approved. He wanted to learn and gain wisdom from his heavenly father. I went through a few boyfriends before introdu being introduced to Carl, ironically by the person I was previously dating. One day, a couple years later, Carl said he was having lunch with my parents. I thought it was a little bit odd, but must have been clueless. Carl asked my parents for my hand in marriage. They were tickled to have been asked and to know that they would be welcoming, welcoming a second son-in-law into the family. Over the years, Carl has been the son that my father never had. I witnessed Dad teach Carl about mechanics, physics, lawn care, home repair, and so much more. There are sections of Wheaties boxes behind the hinges of our front door. That's how we thickest everything with Wheaties boxes. 
Carl became dad's personal assistant, taking care of medical dressings. Cleaning, showering, clothing, lifting and moving, driving, praying, and so much more. I could not have asked God for a better partner and for my dad, but a better friend. Thanks, Carl. Thank you, God. Dad was a teacher and mentor, which are also tributes of God and God's son, Jesus. Dad knew many, many, many people from many walks of life, some of you better than others, but he would spend time talking on a variety of subjects. But he was also a listener. Before COVID, if you lost family members, he showed up at your funeral. If he was traveling, he would drop in to see you. Natalie, he saw you in Arizona. If he called, he was on the other end of the line. He personally flew and visited each of us daughters when we were living overseas. Relationships, including his 57 years of marriage to mom, were very important to him. Like his savior, he was a friend to many. During COVID, dad and I made many trips back and forth to the doctors in the hospital. I have heard some of our relatives have joked that we're going to wear out that stretch of I-71. We talked about daily events, caught up on what was going on, not much during COVID. News, politics, COVID, health, faith, and how rice could remain tough after being cooked. It did not matter how I, pre how I prepared for his appointments, he still found something I had missed. I was never too early, though I tried. Rarely could I stay a step ahead of him in his timing. Now, Mom, he reached heaven ahead of the rest of us. He was a good dad. He was a wonderful father, along with Mom, to me and to Andrea. And in turn, he framed my understanding of God, my Heavenly Father. Thank you. Anyone else? It's tough to beat that one hard. Go ahead. Right behind you. Right behind you. Go ahead. I'm not going to say much, but um, just the one thing I noticed that was missing from Bethany's story is that when I was in the back seat of that car, I had all three seat belts fastened. <laughs> <laughs> and then just to mention, it was in the obituary, but to me, one of the things that um, I most admired about my dad was how he'd kneel every night before, beside his bed and pray before he went to bed. Uh, I didn't know many people who did that. I mean, maybe I wouldn't know, but that was just such a great example to me. And even at the end, as he was so sick, he wanted to come in and sit at the table and eat breakfast up to days before he passed away. And, um, you know, he had trouble at that point and holding himself up, but he would faithfully pray before he ate every time. And just, I, I learned a lot from him in those things. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, the girls told me that uh, David was very well read in a plethora of all different topics. I just wanted to read a little passage from one of his last books that he was reading, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Here's what it says. Death, strange that there should be such a word and such a thing, and we ever forget it, that one thing should be living warm and beautiful, full of hopes and desires and wants one day and the next day be gone, utterly gone and forever. You know, there's a lot of things that David believed in and thought, a lot of uh, songs that the family has asked us to sing in honor of him. So let's sing um, a couple of David's favorite ones. This is my father's world. We'll sing... Uh, just the first two verses for that, please.
And one, another one of his favorites is Near My God to Thee. Let's sing that together. Well, I, as I talked with a family this week, um, it kind of given me some memories of my own, some thoughts about who David was. I knew him for about four and a half years. I wish it was longer, but uh, that was when I came to the church. But we've talked about it several times. David was very well read. He had a, a curious mind about a lot of different things. Um, he was a, a very honest man. Very honest man. Uh, even when I dealt with him, there was a, a sense of honesty in everything that he said. And if he ever made a mistake, he said, oh man, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way. I said this. Uh, he was very honest. He, as you've heard, he was a massive servant. He served the Lord with all of his heart. Um, when Sarah and I first came he served us in a multitude of different ways. He always continually asked if, we could, if he could help. Um, he brought us Amish uh, vegetables and enjoyed doing that. I, I, like, there was never, we, I felt like we were in a, bo a bottomless pit of vegetables because every time we took the vegetables, he would bring more and we just kept taking more and more and I felt bad. But he just, he loved to do that. He loved to serve. He loved to help. Um, when he was on those mission fields, I mean, for him to do some of the things that he did, uh, now that I know him a little bit better, I'm not surprised because that's kind of who he was. Uh, he also was a, a pacifist. And if you don't know what that was, he, he was basically against the idea of war. And it was at the core of his being he understood that war is probably a necessity in, in, in the world, but as far as him taking part of that, he wanted to kind of put a stiff arm to that. He really did not think that his spot in life was to be a part of that. In fact, uh, he felt that war was harming someone and his spot in life was actually to help. And I thought... Uh, very highly of him in all of the way that he dealt with life. He was a true gentleman and a true genuine man. Um, but with that idea of having peace on this earth, I thought it would be appropriate and the, the family has asked that we sing Let There Be Peace on the Earth. So let's sing that together.
Well, today, um, in honor of Dave, I want to share with you just one of his favorite passages. Uh, last night, I, I don't know which daughter did that. Was that you, Adrian? You, you said that. Uh, they sent me about 10 different pictures of Dave's Bible, and I mean, it was mutilated with notes and highlights and all of that. So when I asked the family, what would you say Dave's favorite passage was? They kind of went, that's a hard one to really answer because he marked his Bible so much that you would never know which one his favorite one was. But they asked me to share with you Psalm 23, and I, I want to be very, very brief. Um, let me read the passage for you, and then I just want to share the first five words, because I really think Dave purposed those first five words in his life. But let me read it for you real quick. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, I got to tell you, if I was giving a lesson on the whole entirety of Psalm 23, I don't think we would be friends because we'd be here probably till tomorrow or maybe even into next week. But I do just want to share with you the first five words. The first two words is the Lord. David thought about the Lord a lot. In fact, uh, many times when uh, they would come to church, they would come a little bit early because we'd have prayer meeting in my office. And Dave almost every time was the first one there because he enjoyed talking. He enjoyed hearing from me, and I enjoyed listening and talking with him. But almost 80% of the time, that conversation, some way or another, came back to the Lord. We could have been talking about tractors, which that would have been a short conversation because I don't know anything. You, you testified that you didn't know much about it because you're a city boy. I'm, I didn't know anything. But we might be talking about anything, but somehow or another, sometime during our little conversation before we all had prayer, David would want to talk about the Lord and his relationship with God. And he definitely had a relationship with God. He often talked about how constant God cared for all of us. And God does care for all of us. In this passage, is King David talking about the care of the shepherd. Imagine the care that a shepherd would have for his sheep. And David Badger realized that the Lord was his shepherd. Well, the next word in that statement, the Lord is. It's a funny word, is. It's not much of a word, but quite Frankly, when you think about it, the word is is quite remarkable. A sheep is an object of property. It was back then in David's day, and it is now. It's a piece of property to the farmer who owns that sheep. It's not a wild animal. The owner actually has value with that sheep. And they frequently put a price on that sheep. It's a good thing to know that we belong to the Lord. We are an object of His. And I don't mean that like we, we are possessed by Him and you know He could throw us away or anything. But we are, we are His. We belong to Him. Do you know that some sheep, actually, many of them, when someone were to call them in the field, they wouldn't just come to anyone. But when they hear the shepherd's voice, they come because they know that they belong with that shepherd. Spurgeon said this, there is a tone of confidence when you talk about 
the word is. There is no if, and there is no but, and there is no, well, I hope so. The Lord is my shepherd. David Badger understood that. He knew that the Lord indeed was his shepherd and continues to be his shepherd. Well, then there's that other two-letter word, my. The Lord is my shepherd. It's actually the sweetest word in this whole sentence, if you think about it. Because he doesn't say the Lord is our shepherd, and he doesn't say the Lord is a shepherd of the world at large, or the Lord is someone's shepherd. He says the Lord is my shepherd. It's possessive. There's belonging there. That little sheep belongs to the shepherd. And the shepherd belongs with that sheep. It's very possessive. He is mine. He is mine and I am his. The shepherd cares for me. He watches over me and he preserves me. There is a tremendous relationship there. There's trust. There is history. I choose him over all the other shepherds. And here's the beautiful thing. He chooses us. Dave understood that. David Badger had a shepherd. And the Lord was his shepherd. Well, that brings us to that last word of the five. Shepherd. The idea behind God's role as a shepherd is to care and to have concern for his sheep. David, King David, really understood this concept because he himself was a shepherd. He, being the youngest of the boys, had the terrible job of being the shepherd. It was a humbling job. The older boys didn't want that job because they were too busy doing important things. But yet this was a very important job because... He was taking care of the family's valuable sheep. And yet no one wanted to do it. Much like our God was willing to stoop down to those dirty, dumb sheep like us. And humble himself and do the job that no one else would and no one else could do. And he was willing to lead the sheep to safety. David Badger knew that he was a sheep. He understood that concept. But he also knew that his God was his shepherd. David knew all about how to care for sheep. He knew all about how to shepherd sheep. And that's why David wrote this. The Lord is my shepherd. If the sheep just went out into the field and they were confident and they could just sit there and eat lush green grass and there was a stream that was gentle right there and they couldn't get into any trouble, then the shepherd really wasn't needed. But I got to tell you, that's not very practical. More times than not, the shepherd was more than needed. In fact, David the King David said to King Saul, before David was king, he was just that shepherd boy, and he came to the, the battlegrounds one day, and he's standing before the, the king that was previous of him, and he says to King Saul, you know, as on the, on the field, when I'm taking care of the sheep, I've, I've killed a lion, and I've, I've killed a bear, because it's important. I was a shepherd, and I took care of my sheep. I protected them. Well, i got to tell you, over the years, David Badger would be the first one to tell any of us that he was cared for. He was loved by the God that saved him. He was cared for and he was protected. Even though you might say, well, how would you ever say that he was protected? He was sick for over 20 years. Yeah. 
But in all of that, God still was guiding him and protecting him and nurturing him. And it was evident by the way Dave lived his life, by the demeanor that David had. I only knew Dave for four years, but in the short time that I've known him, I've heard many times about his witnessing. And I think today it would be a little bit of a loss that I didn't share with you what exactly Dave was witnessing about. The Bible says, number one, that God loves every single person. He loved David and still does. He loves the family. He loves me and he loves you. In fact, he loves everyone in this world. In fact, John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. He loves all of us. But there's a problem in the world. There's a problem with you and there's a, a problem with me. And that problem is sin. We all have it. When you were a little child, no one had to teach you how to lie or how to be selfish. When someone took your toy, you probably hit them. Why? Because that's in us. It's that sin nature. We got to have what's ours. Dave understood that, that he had done some wrong things. He was indeed, even though as good as he was, he was a sinner. And when Dave would witness to people, he would tell people, hey, you know what? God loves you, but we have this problem called sin, and everyone has it. And the sad thing about this sin problem is it separates us from this loving God that wants to have a relationship with us, that wants to bring us to heaven. But I got to tell you, if heaven is perfect, which it is, and I am a sinner, and I say, well, you know, I really think I deserve to go to heaven in my present condition. If I go to heaven as a sinner, then I, I got to tell you, heaven isn't going to be perfect anymore because I, have a, as a sinner, have dirtied heaven. Well, God couldn't have that. So God made a way for us to have our sin problem taken care of, and that was by the person of Jesus Christ. Dave understood that Jesus, many years ago, died on the cross to take the punishment that we all deserve, that Dave deserved. And so Jesus died on the cross. He was buried in a tomb, and the Bible says that he came back to life again in three days. He did that for you and for me and for the whole world. In fact, the Bible says, these things have I written unto you that you can know that you have eternal life that you can know that you have heaven. He also said, Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. David knew that. And so number four, the last thing I want to tell you is Jesus has taken care of all of this. The only thing left for us to do is to accept his gift, to to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. To tell him, God, I know that you sent Jesus to die in my place, to take my punishment, and I'm believing on you. So when David witnessed to several people, those are the things that he said. It was important for him to understand, or for him to help others understand that God loved them, but there was a problem. That's why Jesus came, and we all can accept this Jesus, this gift of eternity. All we've got to do is follow the shepherd. I wonder if today, if you would say in your mind, you know, today I would like to follow the shepherd. Today I would like to accept his free gift. It's as easy as ABC. A, admit that we have a sin problem. B, believe that Jesus died on the cross. And C, just simply call on him. God, I need you to save me. With every head bowed, every eye closed. Again, think of, think of what David would want. Many of you have known him for longer than I can ever imagine. But think of what David would want. He would want us someday to see him in heaven again.
to be with Him and join Him as we worship God forever? Do you know for sure that you'll be there? If not, we can talk to God right now. We can admit that we have sinned. We can believe that Jesus died on the cross. And we can call on Him. Lord Jesus, we thank You so much for the life of Dave. Lord, we thank You for His kindness and gentleness, His love. Lord, His servanthood. Lord, I do miss His laugh. But Lord, we'll see Him someday. You've promised that. And so Lord, that gives us joy and hope. Lord, I pray that you'd comfort the family. And Lord, as we close this service, I pray that your name would be honored and glorified in everything that's been done and said today. In your precious name, amen. Let's sing this last song, if you would. This is the last one that the family asked for. Precious Lord, take my hand. If you'll sing this with me, then we'll close our service. Thank you so much. This concludes our service here. Uh, right after this service, we're going to go right over and uh, do the committal service. And we'd like to invite all of you to that. And then after the committal service, which will just be a short five to ten minute service, uh, we have a luncheon provided for all of you if you're uh, wanting to stay and visit with the family and, and different things. But I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here in honor of Dave and Marilyn. Uh, God bless each and every one of you. Thank you so much.